Welcome everyone to Fielding's Call Across the Globe. It's so nice to see you all as you start joining. I'm Katrina Rogers. I'm president of Fielding Graduate University. Just want to say it is so great to have you all with us today on this fine day. Uh, we have selected March 11th. That was the day that Fielding was founded, that our papers were submitted to the state of California and the United States to found a graduate school for adult learners. It just so happens that in March now, this is also Women's History Month and International Women's Day. And while this is a coincidence, I think it's a very happy circumstance because Fielding has always been open to women in the 70s when we first started, uh, long before women were the majority in graduate education, partially because of our flexible learning model and the, and the ways in which we thought about graduate education as a distributed uh, mentor-based mentor uh, form of learning. So our annual call across the globe has become a tradition since Fielding's 45th anniversary. So we now are modeling the way for our descendants, our intellectual descendants. And it was an event originally envisioned by our Director of Alumni Relations, Hillary Lynn, who's on our call today. So I want to thank you, Hillary, for um, this wonderful idea to bring us together across the world at least once a year. And this is an opportunity for the Fielding community to celebrate our university's anniversary, but also remember our founding faculty and staff and our early alumni. So I now would like to ask everybody to please, in the chat, for those of you that have access to chat, please put in where you happen to be calling from today. And as we usually evidence uh, during this call, uh, we have people from all around the world in all the different time zones. I also would like to welcome our trustees on the call this morning. Uh, I know that several of you have uh, have uh, signed on to be here with us this morning. Uh, we have our board chair, Karen Bogart, Dorothy Agar Gupta, A.G. Green, Russ Goodman, Sabrina Epps, and Patricia Zell. Uh, I do believe that a few other trustees may also be joining us at other times throughout the call. And I just want to thank all the trustees on the call if I happen to miss anyone or someone has joined late. Uh, you are our first line of volunteers. You do a lot of work, much of it unseen on behalf of the university, and we really appreciate your leadership and guidance, uh, particularly during these last several years during the course of the pandemic and, and other kinds of unsettling things that have happened in our, in our world. First, we're going to hear today from Dr. Orlando Taylor, who's our distinguished senior advisor to the president. He's the director of Marie Fielder Center for Democracy, Leadership, and Education, and we'll also be hearing from three alumni. But before we proceed, I invite Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Dr. Allison Davis White Eyes, to do the land acknowledgement. Dr. Davis White Eyes, please. Thank you very much, President Rogers, and thank you everyone for joining us here today. As we celebrate our 48th anniversary, let us take time to acknowledge Indigenous territory and honor the diversity of Indigenous peoples that are still connected to the lands on which we reside. In particular, we would like to acknowledge that this session is presented from Santa Barbara, California, on the traditional lands of the Chumash people past and present. The Chumash people are comprised of the descendants of Indigenous peoples removed from their island of origin, Limu, on Payak, Wima, and Tucan, and they were subjugated by the five Spanish missions during the colonization of the Central Coast from Malibu to Morro Bay and inland to Bakersfield. We also acknowledge the ancestral lands of the Nakachtunk and the lands of the Piscataway and Pamunkey peoples in the Washington DC area, where Fielding's offices are also located and where some of our speakers reside. Our university has an obligation to remember. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people of other indigenous communities. We also want to encourage you and welcome you to check in the Zoom chat box to let us know from where you reside and the indigenous lands you are joining from. For your assistance, we have dropped in the chat nativeland.ca in the chat box to help you in identifying and learning more about the indigenous lands upon which you and all of us reside. Thank you. 
Dr. Davis White Eyes. And for those of you who would like to add to the acknowledgement, please also feel free to put in chat where you are calling in from and the indigenous peoples in that region. I would like now to introduce Dr. Orlando Taylor. Before he was the distinguished senior advisor to the president at Fielding, he also served as the president for as for strategic initiatives and research. He's the principal investigator and director for a National Science Foundation funded grant here at Fielding, which advances women in the STEM fields into leadership positions at historically black colleges and universities and tribal colleges. Before joining Fielding, Dr. Taylor served in several leadership positions. He was at Howard University for many decades. He was also the president of the Washington DC campus of the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. He's been a national leader for many years on issues of diversity and inclusion in higher education. He is a dear colleague, a fierceless advocate, and I am pleased to call him a friend. Um, and today we'll hear Dr. Taylor's tribute to Fielding's founding faculty and outstanding leader, Dr. Marie Fielder. Dr. Taylor. Thank you, President Rogers. And good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for being with us today. I want to open my brief remarks this morning and afternoon by just reminding all of us that women around the world, if you can go to that first slide, have contributed to all of humankind. And they've done it in their own ways. The predecessor of International Women's Day, previously known as National Women's Day, was first observed in the United States on February 28, 1909. Next slide, please. Women's Day was first celebrated in Austria, Denmark, Germany, and Switzerland on March 19, 1911. This holiday has been celebrated on March 8th ever since, as it took place on February 23rd, 1917, on the then used Julian calendar, the equivalent of the March of the equivalent of March 8th on the Gregorian calendar. Its purpose is to celebrate the accomplishments of women to elevate women's issues in public awareness and to encourage the study and commemoration of the vital role of women in society. In my opinion piece that I presented a couple of days ago prior to this event, I pointed out that International Women's Day should be a day for all genders to celebrate because the work of women has, con has contributed to the, the fulfillment of dreams of people across the globe for all people, regardless of their own sexual orientations or their gender and so on. I believe frankly that Women's History Month and International Women's Day should be a time where we proclaim that women's accomplishments and their empowerment benefits everyone. And therefore, I urge all men, and I see there are a number of men on this call, and I'm very happy about that, recognize and commit to being an ally in the fight to eliminate gender inequitable treatment and negative stereotyping of women because it hurts us all, not just women. Next slide, please. I want to take just a moment before going to my refielder to celebrate many women who have made significant contributions to the world. Of course, they've received many accolades for their own accomplishments, but their accomplishments really supported and advanced people of all sexual persuasions or sexual orientations and all in both genders. The first person is Rosalind Franklin. And some of these names I picked intentionally because they may not be names you know, but they are, they've made significant contributions. Rosalind Franklin, sometimes called in a book called The Dark Secret of DNA. We all know that DNA has, has completely revolutionized the world. Uh, she was a British scientist. Sadly, she died at the age of 38. But because of her research in X-ray crystallography, it provided the framework for three other men <laughs> to make the discovery called uh, the double helix of DNA. Francis Crick, James Watson, and Maurice Wilkins, Wilkins rather, uh, obtained the Nobel Prize in 1962. 
but it was based on the research that they all did in 1952, but it was the X-ray crystallography that Rosalind Franklin produced, and they admitted to this, that they would have not made that discovery. Sadly, Rosalind Franklin died at the age of 38, right before the award was to be made by in, in, um, Stockholm for, the, uh, for uh, the Nobel Prize, and therefore, based on the model, she could not, she could not receive the Nobel Prize. But that's the name to remember. Rosalind Franklin, somebody that made a contribution as a woman that contributed all of society all over the world, around the globe. Next, next slide, please. The next slide, a name that many of you may know, Mother Teresa, missionary known as a Catholic and known in the Catholic Church as St. Teresa of Calcutta, devoted her life to caring for the sick and poor. She experienced her call within a call in 1946. In order, and her order established a hospice, centers for the blind, aged, and disabled in the leper colony. She received the Nobel Peace Prize for humanitarian work and died in 1997, was beatified in October 2003. Mother Teresa made a great contribution to the entire world. Another person. The next person, next slide is Katherine Johnson. Many of you will recognize that name. You probably saw the movie, uh, Hidden Figures. She's an American, she was American mathematician uh, who calculated and analyzed the flight paths of many spacecraft during her more than three decades with the United States Space Program. Her work helped send astronauts to the moon. She co-authored many research papers, played an important role in NASA Mercury, NASA's Mercury program from 1961 to 1963. And she made a significant contribution to the flight of Freedom 7, the spacecraft that put the first US astronaut in space, Alan B. Shepard Jr. A name that many people might not know. Katherine Johnson made it possible for this successful voyage to occur. And it made it possible for the men on the flight to survive the flight and to come back safely. Another example of the work of a woman who enabled a, a benefit for all of us and supported men. Next slide, please. Next slide is Dolores Huerta, labor rights activist who worked with the late Cesar Chavez to organize and run the United Farm Workers. Many of you know her background. She was a co founder and first vice president of the United Farm Workers. And for more than 30 years, decided her life, dedicated her life rather to the struggle for justice, dignity, and a decent standard of living for one of the United States' most exploited groups, the men and women and children who toiled in the fields and orchards picking the vegetables and fruits to stock grocery stores. We, by the way, awarded Marie uh, Dolores Perta the Marie Fielder Medal for Social Transformation in 2019. Another woman who made a contribution to all of humankind, though we recognize her accomplishments as an individual. Next slide, please. A contemporary person is Stacey Abrams, a political leader, voting rights activist, and a New York Times bestselling author. She served in the Georgia Democratic uh, Congress uh, House of Representatives for seven, ye for seven years. She became uh, uh, the uh, leader of the Democratic Party, and she uh, was the first a Black woman to become a gubernatorial nominee of a major party in the United States. She's a major force of, of advancing voting rights for everybody, particularly for disenfranchised people and marginalized people. And she believed, and many people believe, one of these days she perhaps will be a candidate for president of the United States. These are great women, all of them. And it's, you know, the list is endless, but women who not only were accomplished and not only who had contributed to the advancement of women globally and domestically, but contributed worldwide. Next slide, please. And of course, Dr. Marie Fielder. What can I say about Marie Fielder that you probably don't already know? One of the first researchers to document cultural bias and intelligence tests, instrumental in making two-way busing a reality in Berkeley, California, which basically stated that integration across racial groups in schooling was not only important to the marginalized, but they, it was also important to the dominant groups. 
So it was the two-way busing model that moved uh, black children from the neighborhoods in Berkeley, California to predominantly white schools in the area and vice versa was the first. And it was, it, it's really it's, it set up a model that was very important. She was a member of the founding family of Fielding, served on our first board of trustees and the Marie Fielder Center is, it was established in honor of her work. Next slide, please. We award each year the Marie Fielder Medal from the Marie Fielder Center for Democracy, Leadership, and Education. It provides a multidisciplinary and inter-school space for Fielding's faculty, students, and alumni across all disciplines to engage in research, public discourse, and advocacy on the advancement of social democracy, leadership, and education. And as I said a moment ago that Marie Fielder's principles of transformational change for social justice really exemplifies what feeling is about as a university, equity, education, and justice. So we awarded the medal, we award this medal annually. I mentioned a moment ago, we awarded the medal to Delorte Horta in 2019. We award it annually and we'll be doing that again in 2023 in January. And I invite all of you to come to the ceremony where we will announce the winner and bestow the medal upon the recipient. We now have the Marie Fielder Fellows Program, and if there are students in, on the uh, call this morning, I invite you to consider uh, signing up to become a Marie Fielder Fellow to advance your work that seeks to advance those notions of equity, education, and justice. This is an opportunity for you to engage in, with people who have similar interests above and beyond their regular academic work. There are some interesting benefits uh, uh, available. I won't go into that this morning. But it is something that we believe in as a very important symbolic and uh, effective mechanism for us to advance the work of a refielder. Next slide, please. If you read my reflections the other morning, I framed it in the context of a rising tide lifts all boats. The origin of this phrase is somewhat debatable. <laughs> it was a uh, is often attributed to former President John Kennedy, who made a speech in 1963 in support of a dam project. And that's without an end on that word, by the way. <laughs> it, uh, it, it, was, it, it actually is a version of a, 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 of a concept that's been around for centuries in the Chinese language. Regardless of the source, the phrase is most appropriate for us to remember during Women's History Month and International Women's Day. Since many, as I've said before during in my presentation this morning, many of the enormous accomplishments and contributions of women of diverse races, cultures, and nations have lifted the boats for all people and for all societies. Yes, gender equality benefits women, International Women's Day, celebrates women and serves as a platform to advocate for women's equality everywhere in the world. And thus, we ought to celebrate this day, this month, every day and every month of the year. I can say personally in my, as I close, that my privilege of having worked in an environment that's largely been with women throughout my professional career has been a great benefit to me and has been a great benefit to work that I have done. By having diversity of gender in the workplace and in our universities, these to an environment where questions might get asked that otherwise might not have been asked. So they may have been asked in a different way where interpretations of data might be different based upon who's uh, reviewing the data and how it's disseminated. And so in the process, all genders benefit by having the privilege of having a, the a presence of individuals who raise diverse questions through their own lenses and through their own experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Really appreciate your remarks. Uh, not only was that a beautiful tribute to Dr. Marie Fielder, but I really appreciate you bringing in so many other outstanding women leaders, which is what we're celebrating today as we celebrate together Fielding's anniversary, our 48th, and outstanding 
women leaders. And so the second part is we really wanted to focus on fielding graduates and some of the work that our graduates have been doing. And we asked each of our panelists today to share how fielding education has influenced their own leadership and how it's influenced their vision for their professional lives. Our first panelist, many of you know, is Dr. Marjorie Wu, and she represents three geographical regions in the world. Uh, whenever I speak with Marjorie, I'm never sure if she's in Shanghai or Taipei or Austin, Texas. And Dr. Wu is the founder and chairman emeritus of the Keystone Group in Shanghai, a coaching innovator in Asia. A Keystone provides certificates to Asia-based coaching candidates for various certification programs. Uh, she and her cohorts, Dr. Wu and her cohorts, have coached over 2,000 managers and senior leader executives annually, and over the decades, 30,000 mid-level managers in China. Dr. Wu earned her PhD in human and organization development systems from Fielding in 2012, a decision she deemed in her own words as life-changing, and her dissertation title was Beyond the Chinese Dream, How Women Executives Working in Multinational Corporations in the People's Republic of China Describe and Make Meaning of Midlife Transition. She's also a master certified coach and the former director of professional coaches global board of the International Coach Federation. Welcome Marjorie and I now turn it over to you. Thank you, President Katrina. Our distinguished panel, faculty, alumni, associate, and greetings to you all, uh, wherever you are. It is my honor to share my journey at Fielding that was uh, indeed life-changing through several transformative stages. My background was influenced by the teaching of Confucius thinking, the long-term developmental stage of self, family, community and society. As it said here, if you think in terms of an ear, plant a seed. And if you think in terms of 10 years, plant trees. If you think in terms of 100 years, educate people. So through my journey at Fielding, I experienced three stages. And the first one is critical thinking, that uh, through learning and curiosity about critical thinking enabled me to gain broader perspective and empathy towards others and willingness to apply practice of diversity and inclusion. And my wonderful faculty was their mentoring and humor that uh, over the years. And um, the second one is integration that I've always been a practitioner turned scholar. And uh, from emphasis on personal career to entrepreneur to really importance of uh, succession planning and team building. And again, I feel the alumni had worked with me and uh, uh, through, through the journey. And uh, the third one is actualization of personal and work vision, mission, and values from sponsoring others. And this in particular, my gratitude towards fielding each step of the way. Our faculty, our alumni, my schoolmates have worked, teamed with me in many phases. So today, I think fielding in Asia and emerging economy has lifted women professionals, entrepreneurs to their potential through self-awareness, development, and empowering others. And you can see this picture here that in back in 2009 that I signed up uh, with the evidence-based coaching class, and then a seed was sown to plan to bring EBC certification to China. And our faculties, many are present today, have worked with me through the past 12 and 13 years. And as of now, we have over 380 EBC graduates. In 2021, formed the Alumni Association. 
and trees were plant. And the Alumni Association would, um, it, it is initiated and managed in our uh, alumni here. From that pool that we have now 12 fielding PhD EDD graduates and candidates. Now they are to inspire others for the next 100 years. So in closing, the fielding has walked with me through all the stages and, uh, and I dearly resonate with fielding uh, saying change the world start with your with yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wu. Uh, you'll see in chat that some people are are calling out and thanking you for your presentation. Really appreciate it. And um, I love the quote about education versus planting trees. I hadn't heard that before. So thank you for sharing that in particular. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Dominique Eugène, uh, comes to us from both Pacific Grove, California in the United States and Cape Town, South Africa. She holds a PhD in clinical psychology from Fielding and is also an Institute for Social Innovation fellow. Her dissertation was titled, Predicting Violence in Intimate Relationships by Women Exposed to Childhood Maltreatment. Dr. Eugène currently resides in Cape Town where she holds a position as a global health fellow on behalf of Harvard University, Boston University, Northwestern University, and the University of New Mexico. Her career has focused on children, family, and community well-being in low to mid-income countries. She's also a clinical psychologist, as I said. She's an, a licensed marriage family therapist, a registered play therapist and supervisor, a certified tra trauma specialist, an infant family and early childhood mental health specialist, and a nutritional therapy practitioner. Dr. Eugène could not join us live, but she thoughtfully produced a video message and please welcome her. I have been Good morning, everybody. Hi there, greetings. This is Dr. Dominique Gouja. I'm coming to you from Cape Town, South Africa. I have been here for the past four, almost five months. I came in the end of October. I'm here, part of my HBNU Fogarty Fellow. Um, I'm doing research with Stellenbosch University. So this is pretty much an extension of my dissertation. So I'm here working on looking at women offenders of intimate partner violence and trying to figure out how that fits in in the whole spectrum of Cape Town and South Africa as a whole. So my story, <laughs> my story of what led me to fielding. Well, prior to starting fielding, I recall my clinical director at the time asking me, why do I even want to go back to school? To her, it just seemed like a foreign idea. I was already a division manager. I was overseeing all three of our sites, um, working on children's programs, supervising training staff, creating programs, and so on and so forth. And all I can remember telling her at the time was like, why not? Um, it was something I always wanted to do. I was always interested in pursuing my, the highest education possible while having the world as my teacher. I wasn't planning on quitting my position at the agency. And I wanted to enroll, enroll at a university that wasn't necessarily a brick and mortar or with traditional age students. Fielding seemed like the right fit for me at the time. In reading up on the school, I figured it would be a great way to embrace and partake in being an adult learner. Um, Fielding provided me the environment to let my, my ring spread. Um, and basically give me the freedom I needed to be all that I can be, you know, working full time, trying to have a life and basically figuring out how to complete my educational endeavors. There were several instructors I gravitate, gravitated to at Fielding. Um, these instructors pretty much helped broaden my horizon, help support me and give me the oomph that I needed to continue with my pursuits. 
Um, I have to give homage to Dr. Nolan Penn, Dr. Deborah Bendal Estroff, the departed Dr. Henry Sober, Dr. Sherry Hatcher, and Dr. Joe Bush. These instructors were supportive, encouraging. They gave me the space to incorporate my travels into my to, into credit opportunities. They, along with several classmates and other cheerleaders, helped me spread my wings, reach for the stars. But on the way there, I had to figure out how to break the glass ceiling. I'm still working on that one. I'm also trying to figure out how to get my seat back on the proverbial table, let alone which table I even want to sit in. My vision for the future is a work in progress. I definitely want to visit all seven continents. I've entertained the idea of being a global ambassador of sorts. I want to be the change I want to see in the world. Again, I want to be the change that I want to see in the world. I want to laugh more, cry when I need to. And whenever I feel the need to cry and purge, allow myself the space to do so considering the times that we're living in. I definitely wanna stress less. I wanna to remember to say please and continue to say thank you. While doing all that, I'm also entertaining the idea of working for the UN or the WHO or some global platform. I don't really know what I wanna do. All I know is what I don't want to do anymore. It's not, status quo anymore. It's not just doing business as usual. In the past two, going on three years or wherever we're at with this basic pandemic and the events that's taking place around the world, I wanna see where I fit in. I wanna see how I can make a difference in the world. And I definitely wanna see how I could be a good human being and move away from the chaos that we've been enduring. At this age, I definitely want to have a lot more peace in my life. I don't know where I'm going. I know that basically I go wherever the wind blows me with my feet solidly planted. Life is a roller coaster, and all we can do is strap onto the ride and hope for the best for tomorrow, but tomorrow is not promised. As we try to figure out what we're going to do with the next steps, with the next days that we endeavor to move on with our lives, we take the time or we try to take the time or we remember to take the time to take a deep breath and say thank you. And remember that basically there's so much to be done in the world. There's so much goodness in the world. There's so much people in need in the world. And there's so much that we've been enduring as individuals in our own space and time with the levels of depression that we're dealing with, with civil unrest that continue each year, with environmental pressures, environmental changes, with so many different things that's going on. It's great that we are able to say and come together and do the best that we can. At the same time, we have to look around and realize and see how things are unfolding around us and how we could partake in making the changes and making a difference in the world around us. With that, as I said, I still don't know what that's going to look like as far as what I'm contributing into the world. I definitely know that there needs to be change and every person has their own personal responsibility to make those changes. And the best person I could start with is myself. So thank you for coming and joining us this morning. Thank you for being part of this platform. Thank you for the contributions that you've made. And I look forward to seeing you in other opportunities or other venues. Stay safe, stay as thin as you possibly can. Hug your pets, hug your loved ones. Take deep breaths, cry and smile when you can. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure.
Thank you, Dr. Eugene. And even though that was a recorded presentation, I think you could see her love for others and care for the world uh, in that beautiful message and also the encouragement and the profound nature of what she just spoke to us about. I look forward to hearing that again as I think and reflect upon it, uh, to take good care of ourselves, to think about our own role in change in the world. Um, now we're going to turn to our third speaker, traveling to Athens, Greece, Dr. Adriana Elidis. Dr. Elidis is a Greek American native speaker and bilingual coach. She divides her time between the United States and Europe for training and coaching. She is the co-founder of Executive Communication USA, uh, Hellas Cyprus Incorporated, an international company specializing in corporate training, translations, and executive coaching. As you can see, she wrote her dissertation, uh, leading through turbulent times and crises, what human attributes play a role in the ability of women leaders to navigate crises in their organization. She's worked as a corporate trainer and coach for many years uh, at the Coca-Cola Hellenic Bottling Company and subsequently obtained her MBA with honors in organizational behavior and executive coaching at the University of Texas in Dallas before she came to Fielding. And she holds a PhD in organizational development and change with a concentration in evidence-based coaching from Fielding. Presently, Dr. Elitis is a doctoral candidate in organizational leadership and learning at Columbia University. Uh, just knowing that many of us engage in lifelong learning. And I now turn the mic over to you, Dr. Elitis. Hello, everybody. Thank you, President Katrina. First of all, I must say it's so nice to see um, so many familiar faces and names here. Um, and it brings back uh, great um, memories and, and feelings. Um, so hello to everybody. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, also, uh, Elena and Hillary for uh, bringing us here. This, is, this was a great idea and uh, definitely uh, connects uh, alumni uh, to the present uh, students and candidates at Fielding. So, um, so I was asked one of the questions uh, to discuss about my role model, uh, my woman, my female role model. So I gave it a lot of thought and there are definitely a lot of women that I admire, famous women and uh, Dr. Orlando, I discussed many of those and there are definitely a lot more. But for me, my role mother has been my mother. So I decided to talk a little bit about her. Unfortunately, I've lost her uh, about 15 years ago um, but her influence in my life um, has been detrimental. So she comes, she came from a little village in an island in Greece named Karpathos, where she was raised um, and grew during World War II, where she uh, had no choice but to learn Italian instead of Greek because it was under uh, the Italian occupation back then. When the Italians actually left the island and she had to go back to Greek school, she really couldn't do it because although at her house they spoke Greek, her education was in Italian. Therefore, she didn't manage uh, to finish uh, high school. She got married to my father when she was 19 and then left from the island and went to the city of Athens in Greece. Now, the, 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 the life was very difficult. They were poor, so they decided to immigrate to the United States. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, I had two siblings. I had to let them behind with a grandmother. A lot of immigrants used to do that because they couldn't afford to bring the children with them. I was lucky because uh, they gave birth to me in the United States, and I was the only child that actually grew up with them. Uh, my siblings grew up with a grandmother. Um, my mother was a very dynamic person, although she was not educated, she was very smart, but not only IQ smart, and this is all these things is something that I realized later in my life. She was uh, emotionally intelligent, she was social intelligent, she was culture intelligent. And uh, I was very lucky that I grew up uh, with a mother like this because she gave me a lot of that embedded in me without me knowing so unconsciously. I was more intelligent than I knew. I realized this through my studies, through my collaborations, and uh, until today, I feel so lucky that I was raised by this woman. Uh, she accomplished, for example, to get a degree as an assistant nurse with her poor English, uh, but she sat down when she was over 60 years old and she 
uh, managed to finish that degree. For me, that was something uh, usual, like, oh, everybody can do that, until I realized that, no, <laughs> this is not how uh, everybody uh, operates around 60 years old. Um, so uh, I gained so much uh, from her. I, I could talk forever about my mom. So, um, so I really thank her uh, where she is right now, and I live every day um, with her memories and advice and the way she raised me. And just one note before I go on to the next slide is that I noticed, because I am an executive coach, as you heard, and there is a methodology and a foundation of skills and tools that we use. She used those tools. She basically coached me through my life without her knowing she was doing it. So that's why coaching came to me so natural because I have been coached uh, all my life by this woman. By She always asked my perspective. She always asked me open-ended questions. She was very empathetic, understanding, um, never really punished me, maybe, twice or third, three times in my life. Uh, so I was very lucky um, on that realm. So let's go to the next slide. So moving on, uh, my studies, uh, because of, of who I was and how I was raised, I was very interested in women and women leaders in particular as I've been in the corporate realm since a very young age. And uh, I'm, very, I'm very interested in the behavior part. So this is where I conducted the research um, on women uh, leading during crises. I was also uh, a woman leader during the financial crisis in the United States and in, in Greece. And that's uh, uh, where uh, all these uh, attributes came in. Now I picked one, which is empathy, in order to continue my studies, as you'll see that and being an empathic leader is one of the attributes and the uh, distinctions of the she model that I created uh, when I was in fielding. Um, as I'm very interested in empathy, uh, that's where I'm working on my second dissertation at Columbia University. So I am looking um, into find um, what can empathy do and how can empathy influence uh, leaders' uh, collaboration relationship with their people and how could that increase the quality um, of life uh, in a corporate realm. And that's what I'm really interested in is how can we make everybody's life mm -hmm. in organizations better so people can actually get up in the morning and wanna go to work. Um, so fielding uh, opened the paths with, you know, for me in order for exploration, in order to critique. It taught me how to do research. It taught me uh, that I don't have to be a PhD in order to critique, right? That was one of my uh, kind of, um, worries, how can I critique somebody else's work that has a doctorate and I don't have one yet. Uh, so after I went over that uh, hurdle, I was able to uh, open up my wings and explore further. So empathy is uh, what I'm working on now. And uh, I think I owe all this to my work and studies uh, that began at Feeling. So that's all I wanted to share. Uh, I know that we're probably about time. So thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. And thank you to all of you who have contributed in my um, academic life. And I do see a lot of you here and you know who you are. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Elitis. That is really interesting work. And I look forward now you've inspired me personally to look up your dissertation. I'm very interested in the different kinds of manifestations of leadership around empathy, compassion, trust building, et cetera. So thank you so much and for being here today to all of our speakers. Uh, it is, we were wanting to conclude the call within you know, 45 to 48 minutes and I see that we have done so. I would just like to say thank you to all of you who are here today and I hope wish you a terrific month and may this be another touch point in a year that is a, a good one, a safe one and a healthy one for you and your family and your loved ones. Uh, there's been a number of conversations on chat. We will be following up with people. Uh, we do save our chat and we have recorded this call. So please encourage others to listen in. If you found this to be a meaningful experience, please encourage uh, other friends, alumni, colleagues, people within fielding, without fielding to listen to the call today. Uh, thank you again, and I wish you all well. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.